For those of you who are at the south site in the north campus, a very special welcome to be a part of this service. And I invite you there and us here to pray. We want to see you, Christ, standing forth from this text. We believe this is the inspired word of the Apostle John and that what he speaks is meant to bring you in the 21st century to a living bearing upon our souls. You are in heaven, the God-man. Your word is on the earth and it now runs by your spirit and reveals yourself if we would have eyes to see. And so grant us those eyes. And I ask, Father, that all the healings that you do would lead us to holiness. You said to this man, go sin, go sin no more. So I pray that sinning would take a blow tonight, today, in Jesus' name, amen. This is an amazing passage, these verses 1 through 18. Um, it shows us about Jesus, things that uh, probably we're familiar with, and yet seeing them in new ways can open our eyes afresh to him. It deals with the fact that in, in this world where there is disease and calamity and death all around us, this is true in spite of the fact that Jesus has absolute power to heal. He just speaks a word and bodies obey him, so what's the deal with all the sickness in the world if he's that strong? And so I'm praying that uh, we'll see him, we'll understand this healing, we'll know where it's leading, and we'll have some sense of why more people aren't healthy. Let's start with the setting, verses 1 to 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So this is now he's going up again. Came back from there through Samaria, now he's going back again. Now, there is in Jerusalem, uh, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. So three observations from the setting here to get us in the right place. Number one, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He makes a point to go to this pool. He didn't have to go. He chose to go. There are people with diseases and disabilities there. And uh, they're waiting for the, the waters to be troubled because evidently healings happen. It doesn't tell us why or they happen, and, and uh, so people gather, and, and then some of them, or one of them, it seems, gets healed. Second observation. Verse 4 is missing in ESV, NIV, NASB, uh, but there in the old authorized King James Version. So what's with the missing verse? The verse 4, uh, which you can't see if you have a more contemporary version, is omitted intentionally and I think rightly because it is missing in the oldest and best Greek manuscripts. Uh, just a little lesson in text criticism here. The New Testament was written in Greek and there are extant in existence 5,000 plus manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts, which is an embarrassment of riches. There is no other ancient document, bar none, that has so many documents 
manuscripts, not printed versions, but manuscripts that were originally copied out to compare with one another so that in the comparing, those who are called text critics and do this for a living can amazingly work their way back through all the comparison of these texts and their oldest versions to a very reliable version that then gets translated into various languages of the world. Now, probably what happened with this verse, and I'm not going to spend a long time on it, but I thought you'd stumble if I didn't say something like, where's verse 4? Um, I think verse 7 is crying for an explanation that verse 4 probably was provided in a margin and then worked its way into a text as people copied it. That's just a guess. Look at verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. And if, if that's all you knew, and, and it is all we know, you'd say, well, what's up? What, who stirs the water? And why is there a healing? And what's going on here? And now here's verse 4. You don't... if you. If you don't have the King James, you don't see it, except in the footnote, perhaps. It says uh, that the invalids were, quote, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. And so now verse 7 makes sense, because that's there, and, and now we understand. And that may be exactly right. It's just not in any of the early manuscripts and it has other marks of not being in the original document that John wrote, hence the omission of it. Fortunately for us, and this is the case with virtually all uh, omissions and differences, they don't bear on any crucial doctrine. So if you took all the uncertain omissions that are there because of the original manuscript, nothing would change as far as what we believe about Christ. So I'm not going to say any more about verse 4. You can study up on that if you want to and study our, our manuscript evidence. Here's the third observation. That was number two. First, they're in Jerusalem. He intentionally goes. Second, verse 4 is missing. Just three observations about the setting. The third one is this term, multitude of invalids. You see that in verse 3? In these lay, in these colonnades lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. That's going to become important. Because if you look at verse 13... It says, and this is going to be significant why he did this, it says Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place, large number. So you've got probably, I don't know, hundreds of sick people and probably a lot of caregivers. So Jesus has chosen to walk into a situation just packed, evidently, with people which probably highlights the uniqueness that he fingers one man and only one. So hold on to that. Note it. There's a multitude there, and we'll come back to see what the implications of that are. Now verses 6 through 9. And the question we raise here is, who is this Jesus? When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. We've, we've read these stories so many times we, we don't have our breath taken away anymore. Believe me, he did. 
and so did everybody around him. First observation. I, th I think what John is doing here in the way he tells the story is he's highlighting the unparalleled knowledge of Jesus, the amazing compassion of Jesus, and the immediate sovereign power of Jesus. I think that's what's going on. So let's take those one at a time. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, just knew that, he knows this man's situation. Without being told, he knows this man has been here a very long time. He's paralyzed, he's unable to walk, perhaps been there hoping for a miracle for year after year. Maybe when, when he was a boy, his parents brought him and now he's, he's 38 years old or the paralysis came later and he's older than that. But this has been a long, hard life. And there he is and Jesus knows it. He knows this man. And I just want to linger on that for a minute because it's, when you, when you hear the next two, this one becomes more precious. When you know Jesus, that is when you are granted by God the spiritual eyes to see him for who he is, and you now know him, you know him as friend, savior, the supreme treasure of your life. That he knows you perfectly is unspeakably precious. I just commend you to think about this. To know someone, to have a conversation with someone who knows everything you're going to say before you say it. What would a conversation like that be like? Why, why, why am I talking? To know Christ is an unusual relationship. It's not your ordinary relationship. He knows you. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows every feeling that you have. He knows every thought that just glances through your mind that you're so glad nobody else knows went through your mind. He knows it went through your mind. And every word that comes out of your mouth, he knows it all together before it is on your lips. Linger on that and let it have an effect on your friendship. Talk to him about that tonight. Talk to him about that. Have a conversation about what it means that he knows you so well so thoroughly, all your, your history. Number two, compassion. This is one of those other things that, if it's true about Jesus, makes being known by him more precious. I mean, if he were mean-spirited and hard-hearted, to be known by him would not be good news. But if he's as compassionate as he appears to be in this text, then... That's good news. Now here he, he chooses to go to this pool. He chooses to go here. And he didn't have to. It didn't sneak up on him. He didn't stumble by. He chooses to go here. In fact, let your mind run back over a few weeks. I think he chooses to go to this pool the same way he chose to go to Samaria. Why Sychar? Why the well? We know why. There's a woman there. She's had five husbands. She's sleeping with her boyfriend. That's why he went to Samaria. It was no accident. She would be his unlikely instrument by which he would get a great revival in Sychar and hundreds of people would probably turn to him and call him the savior of the world. Jesus knows what he's doing. He's after people. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. He's after, and then, and then he leaves Samaria and last week he goes to Galilee. Why? Prophet dishonoring Galilee because there's an official there with a sick boy who will pass a test. That's why. And then he's gone. He's back to Jerusalem. What's he doing in Jerusalem? He's going to a pool and finding one man. This is the way Jesus is. Don't, don't think Jesus is into crowds. Jesus is into individuals. Big time. Like you. And he has the capacity to do that now that he's in heaven, which is one of the reasons why he said, it's better for you if I go, 
And if I stay because if I don't go, then the comforter can't come. And I'm coming in the comforter, and now I can relate to everybody at the same time individually. That's another sermon. But it's really good, really precious. I haven't written it yet. He asks him if he wants to be healed. Verse 6, do you want to be healed? And the man doesn't say yes. He says, verse 7, and, and I think this is significant but because Jesus doesn't even hesitate. He just goes ahead and does it. He says, sir, I, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred and, and while I'm going, another steps down before me and, and the next thing out of Jesus' mouth is, get up. Now, what's going on here? Why? He says, do you want to be healed? The man says, you don't seem to understand. You've got to get to the water. And I can't get to the water, and I've been here a long time. And I think the reason for that answer is to set us up to say, Jesus felt a lot of compassion for that. When he heard that story, which he knew already, he just felt for this guy. I counted nine times. I just looked up this, you know, this Greek word splankanon, splanknidzomai, which means bowels and guts. And it, he was moved, his bowels were moved with compassion in the old King James. I looked that up to see how often this happened. I counted nine times in the Gospels where Jesus is moved, moved here with compassion. Just compassion. This man gives zero evidence of faith in Jesus, makes no profession of faith whatsoever, nor does he have any recognition of who Jesus is. He is totally disqualified for being healed as far as faith goes. One qualification, he has a massive need, and he's had it a very, very long time. That's all. So I think that's what we're supposed to feel at this point in the story is this Jesus is moved. He's, he's easily moved. He is not hard-hearted. He is soft-hearted. He is easy to touch. He can be pricked by your condition. He is a, Hebrews, sympathetic high priest. What's that mean? Not unacquainted with all of our tests. We usually translate it temptations. Tempted like we are. The word tempt and test are the same. So any test, any pain in your life that would threaten your faith, he's been there, he knows. And so the, the whole point is, he's that kind of, of heart. So it looks like this is a response, not a religious thing, not a faith-filled thing. There's no faith going on here. Man's not even going to have a clue who this was when they ask him, who did this to you? This is just raw Compassion so far, it won't stay there. Or the compassion will have a form that we're not expecting soon. He is easily moved by the misery you feel, but his therapies are not always what you want. There's a difference. When his therapy isn't what you want, cancer, loss of job, tensions at home. When his therapy isn't what you want, it's, it's not because he's hard-hearted. It's not because he's heartless. He's compassionate and he's merciful and he's a sympathetic high priest. But as every doctor or nurse or parent knows every therapy is not easy. Physical therapy after an accident, long, hard recovery, making you bend your knees in ways you don't want them to bend your knees. Let's sum that up. This is what we've seen so far in these verses 6 to 9. Um, he has complete knowledge of us. He has heartfelt compassion for us. And now, um, 
power. Look at verses 8 and 9. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. And I think the word at once, (laughs) I think John, as he writes this, just loves to say that. Because he said it before. Remember? After the official went away, your, your son is well, you can go now. His son is 15 miles away, and when he meets the people who say, he's okay, he says, what time did it happen? Remember that last week? And they said, uh, seventh hour, one o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, he nailed it. That's the time he spoke the word. He just speaks, and 15 miles away, cells change in bodies. And he did here as well. At once, 38 years of paralysis are over. Not just over like, I need some therapy now to get up. I'm up. I'm up and holding my bed. And I'm on my way, probably to the temple, because that's where he's going to be found in a few minutes. Which is a good sign. This is power. This is immediate sovereign power and he still has it he still has it over everything bar none at every minute everywhere on the planet and in the universe he upholds the universe by the word of his power he speaks diseases obey Now, something happens very abruptly here, very abruptly. You don't expect it. When he says it, you don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want this story to go this direction. He says, at the end of verse 9, now, that was the Sabbath. And you say, oh, no. (laughs) Jesus, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, is this story going to turn into a, a, moral, a moral tale about what you can do on Sunday? It was the Sabbath. I don't think so. In fact, not by a long shot. <laughs> the story is not going to go there. Though implications will be there, but probably not the ones you think. And it's most remarkable. In fact, at this point, I, uh, I thought I was going to pour into the sermon all the insights I had about Sabbath, and, and I realized I'm not going to get this in one sermon. So this text has to now have two sermons. So we'll be back to this text, but we'll see some now. The answer is no, this is not going to go in that direction. This Sabbath issue, the Sabbath issue is functioning first to create some dialogue and get Jesus to him in the temple and have a little conversation go on and then some amazing things are going to be said about God works on Sunday. But that's probably next time. Jesus knows what he has done. He has healed a man on the Sabbath. He knows this will create conflict. He's not stupid. The conflict is designed by Jesus to happen. Conflict is the furnace in which the steel of his identity is demonstrated. He's making conflict happen here by doing it on Saturday and not Monday. Could have done it some other time. So in the fires of this conflict, his glory shines, and so I want us to see more of why he did it this way. So verse 10, so the Jews said to the man, who had been, the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me said to me, he said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man 
who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place. Now this is remarkable. Jesus does an absolutely stunning miracle for this man and gets out of there as fast as he can. So that not even the man who was healed had a clue who that was. Now, the question rises then, is Jesus just doing a random miracle? There, I did a random miracle. Now I'm off to do something else. There was a, just a random miracle happened, and now I'm going to go teach somewhere. What's that? You do this miracle and vanish, and this man's got to go deal with it, and he doesn't even know who it was. No, it's not a random miracle, and Jesus knows what he's, he's doing because notice how verse 14 begins. This is a little different than chapter 9, which is very similar. The man did not find him. He found the man. Jesus is tracking him down. He walks away from him, abandons him, gets out of there because a the crowd is there, and, and then he, he tracks him down in the temple. So verse 14, afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. So Jesus had no intention of walking away from this man and leaving him with meaningless health. A mere healed body prepared to burn forever in hell. No way. That's not our Jesus. He doesn't heal people without a reason bigger than a few years of health on the earth and then perdition. So he's pursuing this man. He went after him in the colonnade and then to get out of there he went after him in the temple. So notice a couple of things. At the end of verse 13, he gives the reason why he left him. Jesus had withdrawn, it says, as there was a crowd in that place. So all these sick people and their caregivers perhaps were there, and there would have been an absolute sign-seeking tumult had he lingered and identified himself as the one who took care of that 38-year-old or 38-year suffering paralytic. So that's the first thing. He, he moves out in order to avoid the tumult and all these people give us that and he disappears. And then in verse 14, he finds him and shows him what the real issue is in his healing. Afterwards, Jesus found him, verse 14, in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. What's the issue in this healing? The issue in the healing is holiness. I've made you well. Now I'll tell you what this is about. Stop sinning. This is really important. There's a gospel pattern here that you need to see. My aim in healing your body, and the church could say, our aim in touching the neighborhood, our aim in every manner of ministry that touches the body, the mind, the family, is not an end in itself. Otherwise, we would be cruel to people. Jesus said, I've given you a gift. It's free. You didn't do anything. You didn't do anything for this gift. It came first. You didn't earn it. 
You weren't good enough for it. I chose you freely among all those people. I healed you. Now, live in that power. Know me. Know free grace. And it's power in your life. That's the pattern we're supposed to see here. When he says sin no more, he doesn't, he doesn't mean like on your own. He means look what I've done. Wake up. I've come into the world to forgive sinners. I've come into the world to change things. Look to me. Know me. And in the power that you've just experienced, fight your sin. And yes, and this makes some people uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. He warns him. In fact, he threatens him. A lot of people don't think there should be any warning or any threat in, in gospel ministry. Just promises, 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 and love, 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 and no threats, no warnings. Well, that's not what happens here. Jesus says, I warn you, if you turn away, if you mock this gift that I have given you for the power of holiness and the grace that I have shown you, if you turn the grace of God into license, if you make an idol out of this health of yours now and thank me till the day you're dead for the idol of your health, you will perish forever. Now why do I think something worse in, in this verse is perishing? Two reasons. So when he says something worse will happen to you if you don't stop sinning, and I don't mean perfection. You know that's not what Jesus means or I mean because he taught pray every day. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a daily prayer. He taught us to pray daily. Forgive us our debts. Not once and then we're done. That's because every day we have debts. This is not perfection. This is awaken and fight your sin and make a shift in your life and embrace holiness and embrace me. And he says... If you don't, something worse will happen to you in verse 14. And I, it's hard to think of something worse than 38 years of paralysis. I don't think he means a worse disease. Could, but I don't think so. Because down in verse 28 and 29, he reaches one of the climaxes of this interaction. And he says to the Jewish people, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. In other words, Jesus makes the doing of good and the doing of evil the criterion for resurrection to life and resurrection to judgment. Changed lives are the evidence of a true relationship with Christ. It's the evidence of repentance. It's the evidence of being born again. Chapter 3. So, I think Jesus is saying to him, I've healed you that you may be holy, that you may stop doing evil, like verse 29 says, that you may stop doing the evil of verse 29 so that you won't rise into the resurrection of judgment, but will rise into the resurrection of, of life. I heal in more ways than one. I have healed your body, and now I heal your soul. Press on in that and show that it's true. Now pause here with me. This is about as far as I'm going to get in this text, and the rest is just implication. This is, has a huge implication, I think, for the world we live in. There was a multitude of invalids there. That's the phrase from verse 3. There was a multitude of invalids. And believe me, there's a multitude today. Millions. And he heals 
in the multitude one and walks away. Just one and disappears. He leaves hundreds of people still in, in their sickness. And then he finds the one man that he healed and he says, let me tell you something. You think this was about healing? This wasn't about healing. This was about holiness. I came into the world the first time to deal with sin. Not mainly to deal with sickness. I'm going to deal with some sickness. I'm going to show what the age to come is going to be like. I'm going to point to the glorious day when there will be no more crying, no more sickness, no more disability, no more lameness, no more blindness, no more depression. I'm pointing to that. I'm doing it here and I'm doing it there. But, but mainly, I came to attack the worst thing this world has ever known. Sin. And your healing is about that. Every healing is about that. And every morning when you get up on a bright sunny day is about not sinning. Every disease you get is about not sinning. Every meal on your table is about not sinning. Whether God deals you pain or pleasure, it's about not sinning. That's what he says. I'm going to take you I'm going to illustrate with you, I can heal you just like I could heal all these. And someday, there will be an age in which there will be no more sickness. I have pointed to that. But right now, my agenda is to die for sins. And then to send my people all over the world to lay down their lives to preach the gospel of how sins can be forgiven. Malaria is a horrible thing. H1N1 could be a horrible thing. HIV, AIDS is a horrible thing. And sin is a million times more horrible than any of them. Because its consequences are not 38 years, but 38 million ages of years. And the only reason anybody would consider helping someone with their sickness and not their soul is because they do not believe that. We will be a both-and church, will we not? We will not be forced to choose between loving people in their immediate crisis and need and caring for their souls. I'm just going to say over and over again that if you care for someone's body in any way, with no heart desire for their soul to be saved, you don't love them. I don't care if you do it for 50 years in Calcutta. You don't love them. So the point here is that the first coming, let's get the big picture, the first coming of, of the Son of God into the world 2,000 years ago had this purpose, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I have come to forgive sin. I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. And by my stripes, indeed many will be healed in due time. And then Jesus lived his life in order to show the kinds of things that would happen sporadically here and then totally when he comes back a second time. Jesus had all the power to heal in the world and he did not usher in the final day of perfect wholeness. His ministry points to that day but while this age of groaning lasts I get that phrase from Romans 8.23 Here we, even we who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption of sons the redemption of our bodies. In this hope we were saved. But who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see we wait for it with patience. What's that? Our, our wellness. Therefore 
Bethlehem. We know that by and large, people with disabilities will have their disabilities when they die. And oh, the power for holiness. In fact, think about this. I have seen this with my own eyes. Those who have disabilities, blindness, deafness, not able to walk, mental disabilities, have the capacity often to run with bounds in the path of holiness beyond those of us who are well. Which is why he came. Don't judge quickly who are the blessed. I would even venture to say that the mentally ill, surrounded by loving parents and and friends and Christians who pray for them and model Christ before them in ways you cannot even imagine or dream are down that road farther than you think they are in holiness. So that's the big picture of Jesus finding one man, 38 years, feeling pity for him, just like I hope you do for every broken person you meet, and yet running away from the rest because he didn't come for that the first time. Then finding that man and saying, do you understand what I've done? I want everybody to understand what I've done here. Don't see it anymore. Lay it down. I came to die. I came to heal that people might be whole with me. And then in due time, we will get our new bodies. And we will be whole. Just to whet your appetite for next time. When it gets down to verses 17, 18, and it talks about Jesus saying, I am working and my Father are working, this is his answer to their question. Don't you know it's Sabbath? And Jesus' answer is, my daddy works on Sunday. And so do I, because we made Sunday. You circumcise a man on Sabbath so that a tiny part of his body will be covenant-keeping whole. I heal whole bodies on Sunday. There's so much more to say about his, his creator rights on the Lord's Sabbath, but that's the next time we look at this, let me close like this. May the Lord open our eyes to know Jesus personally. He knows you. He's easily moved in his heart by what is oppressing you. And he has infinite power. And we do believe in miracles. Both physical and spiritual. And therefore, we do pray for each other to be healed. And God does heal people here and there. And it could be that if we believed more and expected more, we would see more. But don't ever go to the point where you say, if I'm not healed, it's because I don't believe. There are churches in these cities that believe and teach that. I prayed with a family I'll stop with this. At the close of last Saturday's service, who were here to see a dying sister in Rochester, and she goes to one of those churches, and they said, it is horrible what she's going through. Beating herself up in the last days of her life that she cannot believe. She cannot believe enough. And she will die guilty. I don't believe that. We don't believe that. Jesus left all of them unhealed to show us it's not mainly in this age about healing. 
Some is mainly about holiness through Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are very great. And your son was sent into the world through the greatest work in all the world to take our sins on the cross. Our sin is the worst disease we've ever known. There's nothing comparable to the disease of sin. It damns forever and ever and ever. Oh, that we might be healed of this disease so that we as a church, by the power of grace, through the love of Christ, make progress in not sinning and always coming back to the cross when we do. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.